Welcome, everyone. Uh, it is noon straight up, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to be the first to say I'm so pleased to welcome you to this town hall on crisis standards of care and the really important and complex roles that age has played in our conversations about uh, catastrophic emergencies and the kinds of decisions that might end up facing healthcare systems in terms of uh, resource allocation during a, a truly catastrophic, overwhelming event. Um, my name is Dr. Matt Winnie. I direct the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado. Uh, my background is in infectious diseases and in public health. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by a distinguished panel of individuals who have been directly involved in one way or another in addressing issues related to the aging community and crisis standards of care. Um, before we get started, I want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. And so um, if you have colleagues who would like to uh, see this but weren't able to log in today, we'll make sure to get the webinar recording information out to you afterwards. Uh, this town hall is a collaboration of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and the University of Colorado's Multidisciplinary Center on Aging. And I'd like to especially thank Jody Waterhouse for all the work she's put into developing the program today. And at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, I'd like to especially thank David Weil and Malia Himber in our center uh, for all of their assistance. This program today is really a great opportunity for our two centers to work together. Um, and it's the first time we've really had this kind of opportunity come together. But if you think about it, both of our fields, um, the study of bioethics and humanities and the study of aging, are by their nature multidisciplinary fields because the kinds of problems that we talk about um, are complex, where there are really important trade-offs and where significant moral values can actually be in tension with each other. Um, it's true in both bioethics and in the kinds of decision-making that people make around aging that there often aren't simple right or wrong answers because what's right or wrong for one person might not be right or wrong for another, and what's right or wrong might depend on which uh, level of priority one gives to different values, um, and all of, and each, you know, with many different values, each of which is very important. Um, I think uh, as we've been working together to put this together, I've been reminded of the old trope that getting old is not for sissies, um, and I think uh, the same can be said about bioethics. Um, dealing with conflicting moral values is also um, not for sissies. I'm going to briefly introduce each of our panelists and then ask them to introduce themselves more fully and to say a few words about their role in the development of guidance around crisis standards of care and aging, and then to provide some of their observations about how age does or doesn't uh, matter in the work that they've done on these issues. So we'll start today with Dr. Anuj Mehta, who's an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at National Jewish Hospital. Um, he also works at Denver Health and the university and a number of other places around uh, Denver. We'll then go to Dan Matlock. Dr. Matlock is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Geriatric Medicine, uh, where he leads programs on medical decision-making for complex medical pro uh, problems. And then we will go to Steve Cantrill. Dr. Cantrill is an emergency physician at Denver Health, and he is a member of the Governor's Emergency Expert Epidemic Response Committee. Actually, I think I reversed those. Governor's Expert Emergency Epidemic Response Committee, um, the GERC, which in Colorado is the uh, Governor's um, Expert Panel that looks at crisis standards of care for the Department of Public Health and the state and presents um, options for the governor to, to look at. And then we'll um, go to Gina Fabraro. Uh, Ms. Fabraro is the Director of Strategy and Performance in the Preventive Services Division at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So I'll turn first to Dr. Mehta. Thanks, Anoush, for being with us today. Of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Winya. Um, uh, it was a real pleasure for me to be able to uh, work with the Center on Aging and the Center for Bioethics um, in 
uh, really dealing with a tough problem that we haven't hit yet. And I really want to start talking about that, that we're not at the point about really talking about crisis standards of care in Colorado. I am a pulmonary and critical care physician. Um, I uh, work at National Jewish Health. I work at Denver Health, and I do a lot of my research at the university. Um, and I got involved in this because I am on the ground. I li literally was in the ICU up until yesterday. So today is my first day out of the ICU in the last week. And I recognize the difficult situation that um, could be posed if we really reached a point where we were at maximal resource utilization. Um, so that's how I got involved. I led the committee that wrote the guidelines for the state. Um, they were updated um, on Sunday, um, which I think we added some very um, important updates. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, let's see, one moment. Sorry, just give me one second. Matt, are you able to see yep. the screen? It's working. Okay. You got us. Uh, perfect. So, um, so I want to first talk, start off by talking about what is a crisis, because I think that's not a term that many of us are familiar with. I think in the United States, we're very comfortable with the amount of health care that we have, and that in, for the most part, if you need health care, you can obtain it. Um, in, in most situations. The Institute of Medicine defi defines a crisis as a substantial change in usual healthcare operations and the level of care it is possible to deliver, which is made necessary by a pervasive, pan such as the pandemic influenza or catastrophic earthquakes or hurricanes event. Now that's a, a complicated definition, but it essentially means that the needs outweigh the, um, the ability for the health system to take care of uh, Take, take care of patients. Um, for anyone that's familiar with the show MASH, um, that was something that most people are actually familiar with. You know, the people that were the sickest would get a black tag on their toe and they may not get emergency surgery um, by Hawkeye and Trapper John. Um, and other people would have green tags. And that was an on the fly decision about who has the best chance of survival. So an example, and we're not there yet, but a, 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 an example is imagine a state that has four hospitals, each with 25 ventilators. And the, so the total state capacity is 100 ventilators. We in Colorado have a lot more than that. Um, and a pandemic occurs um, and 120 people uh, need ventilators at the same time. And this is a situation where the need outweighs the ability of the system to take care of them. So that's kind of what a, that is what a crisis could look like. Um, we're doing a lot of things to prevent a crisis. And I really wanted to um, acknowledge all of the work from our public health department, um, from the governor's office, and from individuals, because that's really what's changing the nature of this uh, a pandemic curve. So the public health response, you want to decrease the number of people of uh, the people that are being that are sick at the same time. So social distancing, which is really hard, staying at home, um, which is especially hard. And then um, a lot of people in the lay press have been talking about contact tracing, which is going to be an important feature moving forward. You want to try and reduce the strain on the health system so that the resources we have can be um, focused on taking care of people sick within this situation, COVID-19. And that's kind of where elective um, surgeries have been suspended because they oftentimes utilize personal protective equipment like masks and ventilators. And you want to um, take those resources and give them to uh, patients that are sick um, um, from the pandemic or sick from something else. Um, and then a really, really critical component of preventing a crisis is sharing resources. And so the state has really taken a leadership role um, in a way that they haven't before. And that already we're transferring patients between institutions where they're um, from one institution that has fewer resources to another institution that may have more resources. In some rare cases, we're transferring ventilators. Um, and uh, you know, this has been critical at preventing us from reaching a crisis point because different hospitals will have different resources available at any given time. And so this is really, all of this is happening now and it's what's prevented us from reaching a crisis. Um, in drafting the documents that um, Colorado has adopted, um, it's been guided by some very core ethical principles, um, fairness, equity, um, justice, transparency, accountability. There's a duty to steward scarce resources, um, consistency and proportionality. And we can talk about, um, Kind of how those core um, ethical principles actually manifested in the drafting of the document and i call these core operational principles because for me i'm a critical care physician i'm an operational person um, so first off 
um, we designed a system that we hope we never have to use. Um, and I think that's really important. We're not using it now and we hope we never have to. Um, the second point is that we, from the very beginning, said there would be no categorical exclusionary criteria by which we would say one person will not receive care because of a single thing that they have. Um, but we operated with this idea of we want to try and save the most lives possible at one year. And that's a little bit different than saving as many lives as possible, because while you may be able to um, uh, provide medical care and help somebody survive for the first two weeks or three weeks, if they have another condition that will limit their one year life expectancy, we thought that that was important to weigh in. And that's kind of what most um, states in the country are doing. Uh, and then we wanted to avoid implicit and explicit bias in the system by blinding the people making triage decisions as best as possible to things that should not make a difference. And so what's in blue here on the right side of the screen is actually um, the actual words from the document. And I highlighted two words in red. This is kind of where age plays, a, um, um, what we explicitly said age should not play a role. So there would be no categorical exclusionary criteria based on factors that are clinically and ethically irrelevant to the triage process. So it's age, race, ethnicity, ability to pay, um, gender identity, uh, immigration status, sexual orientation. And it was really critical that we incorporated that type of language at multiple levels in our document. Um, and we do factor in clinically relevant considerations. But in the second point there, um, it's not at any point a single categorical exclusion based on age or any individual's comorbidity. And this is a little bit of a change um, from 2018 and from actually the original draft of the document that was approved at the beginning of April. So this is the new language that we approved on Sunday. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of what the actual triage document looks like um, for Colorado. I'm gonna highlight where age, um, we think age is important to play a role and where we really think it's important that it shouldn't play a role. Um, and so the, crisis standards of care framework for Colorado is a tiered approach. So this is if we were to run out of a critical resource such as ventilators, how would we decide which patients would receive that critical care resource, um, in this case, ventilators? And what we designed was a tiered approach. Um, the first tier is the triage score. It's an objective calculated value that weighs two things. One, what's your likelihood of surviving days and weeks? So surviving the illness that's making you sick right now. And then what's the likelihood of you surviving one year? And that's really where we stop looking. We, we're not concerned about who's more likely to live five or 10 years. We're looking at one year. And our ability to predict that, as I'll show you, is actually pretty good based on some comorbidities. Um, we recognize that some patients will have a tie. They may have the same triage score. Um, and then we work our way down different considerations. And I'll get to each one of those as we kind of walk through. Um, and at the end, if you tie amongst all of these, we kind of move towards um, tier four, which is a random allocation um, or more generally known as a lottery system. Um, this was designed very carefully with a lot of input from some fantastic community engagement. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fabrara, for all of the hard work you've done there. Um, looking at what's been done in other states and some really core ethical and, and medical and clinical principles. So um, the uh, tier one is a combination of um, how sick you are now and how sick you are in general to predict one year um, survival, the likelihood of being alive at one year. This is a, um, a complicated scoring system that we use. Um, we've automated it to a little uh, to extent. It's called the Adult Sequential Organ Failure Assessment or SOFA score, and it applies to adult patients. And what it does is it kind of, it generates a score that predicts your ability to survive your acute illness based on um, respiratory or lung mechanics, um, problems with your blood, problems with your liver, your cardiovascular system or your heart and blood pressure, your brain and your kidneys. This does not look at, do you have high blood pressure chronically? This looks very specifically of what are we looking at in, in front now while you're sick? Um, and based on how you, um, uh, score on this, you kind of add up um, the scores. If you have very severe lung disease, but your blood and your liver are okay, um, it ends up, uh, you end up adding up the scores to a maximum score of, um, of 24. This is combined with 
uh, what we are terming the modified Charleston comorbidity score. And, I, and the right side of the screen is a little bit busy. I'll get there for right now, just focus on the left side of the screen on the table here. Um, and what this is, is a prediction of how likely you are to be alive at one year. And as you can see, age plays a role here. Um, and what it looks at is age and other comorbidities, specifically heart failure, dementia, chronic pulmonary disease, and you could read down the list. What is on the right side of the screen, this, um, the text, is actually how we very strictly define these comorbidities. So we have very good clinical data to suggest that patients with severe heart failure, not just anyone with heart failure, but severe heart failure meeting a certain few definitions, they're not likely to survive um, one year. Um, and especially when you combine all of these, uh, the, this uh, system has a very high prediction for who is likely, just based on comorbidities, to, um, uh, to be alive at one year. The reason age is incorporated here is because age is not in all scores. And I think um, the incorporating age actually allows us to predict um, one year mortality much better when incorporated with these other comorbidities. And the reason that is, is there's really strong data that in critical illness, not for everyone that is walking around, not everybody going to their doctor in the office, not everybody that's necessarily even hospitalized, but for critical illness, even if you remove all of the other diseases people have, age in and of itself um, is, is associated um, with, uh, with being alive at one year. And that, that's a medical um, finding that we've had through a lot of research, and it was really important to incorporate that. But as we walk through the other tiers, you'll see that we have very special considerations that age not be considered. Um, and that's kind of some of the new language. If there's a tie at tier one, we move on to tier two where there's consideration for pediatrics. And the reason pediatrics was put here is that independent of any scoring system, there's very strong data to support the fact that P, um, children have, uh, have very low mortality in critical illness, me meaning they're very likely to survive critical illness and, and ventilators. And so from a scientific perspective, it was important to incorporate that. And then we included healthcare workers and first responders due to their increased exposure um, uh, to, to, in this case, COVID-19 um, through the work that they do. And we specifically defined it as healthcare workers and first responders involved in the COVID-19 response. Um, Tier three is uh, some special considerations, um, namely pregnancy. So a uh, confirmed pregnant patient would receive some special consideration. Um, and then I'm going to walk through two other um, areas. So as you can see in tier three, there's this concept of life years saved. And so this is, again, taken directly from the text of our updated document. The idea of life year saved is where we consider not just one year, but maybe a little bit longer, up to five-year mortality. And what's in red is really that this principle is not a categorical age exclusion criterion. As a 35-year-old and a 70-year-old patient who have the same triage score, meaning the same types of comorbidities and severity of illness, actually have very similar one-year survival predictions. So the 35-year-old the in this situation would not receive um, special consideration over a 70-year-old patient because we can't say that their one-year or five-year mortality is different. Where it could be used is when we start to consider more specific, disease-specific prediction models. Or, um, for example, um, a preference may be given to a 35-year-old patient over an 80-year-old with metastatic pancreatic cancer. And if you remember, you would have to tie it tier one and tier two and then get to tier three before this is considered. So this means that their triage score is the same. Um, and there are a variety of ways where mathematically you can have the same triage score, but the 35-year-old would get preference over an 80-year-old with metastatic pancreatic cancer. However, in a different situation, a 70-year-old with no comorbidities would actually receive consideration over a younger patient that had a severe underlying illness. And in this example, um, it would be somebody with a really bad liver disease. So as you can see, it's not really the age that's buying the special consideration, it's the underlying illness um, that would be predictive of one to five year mortality. Um, we also uh, uh, modified some language in terms of the sole caregiver concept. And we know that um, a lot of people out there are the only people taking care of, of dependents, both child and adult. And so we thought, it, and we know that when that caregiver um, gets sick and potentially passes away, it has ramifications for either the child or adult dependents. Um, and so we said priority, if there's a tie at tier one and tie, tie at tier two, um, 
priority should be given to um, a, a sole caregiver, and this could apply to a single parent with a young or disabled child, or to a caregiver of a dependent adult, and that would be, you know, uh, a wife, for example, a wife caring for a dependent husband um, who's not able to care for themselves. And so we wanted to consider both children and adults because we know there are a lot of different type of caregivers in the world today. Um, and that's kind of where age has played a role. As you can see, really, it's just in that modified Charleston comorbidity. The, um, the triage team, they're the ones that are calculating the triage scores um, and making some of these triage decisions. We I mentioned that idea of blinding. Um, and they won't even really know how old somebody is when they're making these decisions. It's just how does it contribute to the score? And when you get down to that life year saved principle, you know, age, again, is not what is making the decision. It's kind of what is your underlying medical condition and what's your likelihood of one year survival. Um, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Winia, and I, I, I will have a lot of time for questions. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, really terrific summary of an enormous amount of work that has happened over the last just couple of months, really, to, um, to pull all of that information together and to create that policy. Um, we're going to turn next to Dr. Dan Matlock. Dan? Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks for inviting me onto this panel. Um, I'm Dan Matlock. I'm a geriatrician. Um, I'm also boarded in palliative medicine at the University of Colorado. And I lead the program in patient-centered decisions. Um, we do a lot of research and shared decision-making for major interventions, a, a lot of stuff in cardiovascular disease. Um, and I was not a member of the GERC panel, the, the governor's panel, um, but I got roped into this by Matt, actually. We were having a meeting about something else, and he said, I think I'm gonna hijack this meeting because we have something brewing. And this was, you know, a month and a half ago, a month ago, when this was really ramping up and we were, we were wondering what was going to happen. And said, you know, you do work on patient decision aids. We should th think about how do we communicate to patients about scarcity, if there is, if we do get to this critical research shortage. And again, this was like mid-March. We didn't know what was coming. I mean, it felt, feels completely different than today. Um, and we have this problem where patients may not get to decide because we might run out of resources and the ethics shift from our comfortable patient-centered ethics to an ethic where we are making sure we are, are sharing resources appropriately. But there are some patients I would still love to figure out how do we get the patient's voice into that decision? I thought it was a great question and actually pretty complicated. So we went on a process with a team of developing a tool, it's sort of like a decision aid for patients. If we are in, in a crisis standards of care and we are in, in shortages of resources, um, making sure that patients as they come are aware and then asking them their perspective. Um, and we, we, uh, we worked with a team of about five people and then we had over 40 stakeholders, including patients, review this language and review some materials um, these materials are, are up and freely available on our website at patientdecisionaid.org. I elected not to use slides just in the interest of time because I imagine getting to the discussion will be important and other people on this call have more important slides to show. But we asked this question, you know, if you, if you became sick enough to need life support, what would you want? Um, and we said you could say, I want a life support machine, or I don't want one, even if it's available, or if one is available, I would want it, but consider others who might be more likely to survive. I understand this would mean I am more likely to die. And that third option is, dif is different and unique. And we struggled, and I'm still not sure if it's right. Um, I would love to test it. You know, when we make other decision aids, I spend months to years testing it with multiple stakeholders to get the language right, but we didn't have time. Um, we don't want to coerce people into choosing that. At the same time, we want to make sure people have the opportunity to have their voice heard. And this is trying to maintain that patient-centered peace in the context of a crisis, which again, as Anuj nicely said, I hope we never get to this. And the best case scenario is we, or and Matt said this too, we make these and never need them. It's the same here. Um, but think, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to bring in that patient's peace. And where aging is interesting to me, like me as a geriatrician, I do, I do research for people of all ages, and I make decision aids for people of all ages. But it still is very comfortable to me as a geriatrician because I think decisions get more interesting as you get older. I think a lot of young people, younger people say, oh, I would want all these things done. And I hear from my patients in the seniors clinic all the time, 
yeah, I'll do that if it's not too invasive, or I'll do a little bit. I'll do a few things, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend life on a ventilator. Or I don't want to be resuscitated. And I think those preferences change as you get older, as you gain more life experiences, as you see the downsides of these things. And, and that's where I think the aging angle comes in is I think, I think people's preferences change as they get older. Um, and so trying to think about how we talk about that is important. I, I can tell you as a last comment in my clinic, we are, um, the seniors clinic is doing a great job. We have added to all of our telehealth templates, some advanced directive language. And we are trying to make sure that every one of our patients has a designated medical power of attorney, that they've talked to that person, that they um, have considered other advanced directives, because it's something we felt in the outpatient setting we could do to help the inpatient setting if there is a surge, is at least make sure our patients' preferences were considered and clear. So with that, I, I, Matt, I forget who speaks next. Sorry about that. So I'll turn it back to you for the question. <laughs> We uh, thank you, Dan. So we're going to turn next to Dr. Steve Cantrell. And Steve, I think you're muted right now. There you go. Thanks, Matt. Let me share my screen here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done in Colorado. Does that appear okay? Yep. Yes, we're seeing it. Thank you. Um, about crisis standards of care. I've been working in this area since 2004. Uh, that was on the eve of a, of a possible pandemic influenza uh, outbreak. And uh, we started looking at what we called then altered standards of care. And that has merged, uh, or actually it's progressed into something with a 2009 Institute of Medicine report that I was uh, fortunate to be on the panel that actually wrote that report where we coined the term crisis standards of care. Uh, and then with a subsequent follow-on report published in, in 2012, which really gave a lot of detailed information. Now, Colorado has been a little bit ahead of the game in, in some, some ways. You heard Matt uh, refer to the GERC, uh, Governor's Expert Emergency Epidemic Response Committee, try saying that three times fast. Uh, it's a challenge. And this was really created by statute in the year 2000, 20 years ago, when you think about it. Um, and this was in, Denver had a kind of a unique position. We were one of three locations across the country where there was a simultaneous nationwide disaster. And we were a bio, bio war site. We had a simulated plague outbreak, pneumonic plague, which was released actually at the Space Theater at the Denver Center for Performing Arts. We had actors going into EDs and it was really fascinating. And I think that woke people up, at least in this state, that this is something that we're not very well prepared for. So they created the GERC and the goal of the GERC, as you've heard said, was to advise the governor during an emerging or ongoing public health threat. So it's quite a wide ranging group this is the makeup. So it's everyone from the state veterinarian to uh, the CMO of CDPHE to a wildlife disease specialist, because you know, you're dealing with zoonoses, animal diseases as well, uh, as plague certainly is. So it's a, quite a group of, of individuals. And we have been charged with looking at uh, some of these situations. We were quite active in 2007 again, on the cusp of a potential uh, influenza pandemic. And we actually put together, but we didn't call them crisis standards of care. They were altered standards of care at that time. And that really got the ball rolling in the, uh, in the state. Um, after the, the uh, Institute of Medicine reports, we uh, developed some uh, uh, a more complete set of uh, crisis standards of care. And that was signed by the governor in 2018. And then when things started going south in uh, China and certainly in Italy, it became uh, quite clear that uh, we might have to deal with some aspects of this. So we started looking very critically at what we had done and realized that they were very good as far as they went, but they didn't go far enough. So we put together a, uh, a group of subject matter experts uh, with ethicists, 
specialists and specialists in a lot of different fields to look at these issues. And we decided that there were additional areas that we needed to look at. Certainly the hospital crisis standards of care, which Dr. Maida uh, described, and those were developed and an initial version was approved on the 4th of April. And then we had a revision that was just approved last Sunday that incorporated many of the suggestions that we've uh, received from our, our community engagement partners. It was also felt that personal protective equipment, so-called PPE, was it going to be a big problem? And unfortunately is a big problem in the state. So we developed uh, crisis standards of care for that. And, and similarly, uh, emergency medical services was going to be a problem. And we developed crisis standards of care for that as well. Both of those were also approved on April 4th. Um, the PPE CSC was activated. So it's actually active in the state of Colorado on the 7th of April. Um, and the EMS uh, CSC was activated on the 8th. So we have two crisis standards of care components that are currently active in the state. As is mentioned, the hospital crisis standards of care have not been activated. And again, I agree with all who've already stated, we do not want to have to activate those, but they're there if we absolutely have, have to have them. Uh, we are working in other areas. Palliative care is felt to be a, a problem, certainly and we need to, to uh, develop some crisis standards for that. Behavioral health, uh, that's also in process, and maternal and child health as well. So we're looking at a lot of different areas where we can see that we're going to have a problem if we, uh, if we come up short. Now, in terms of uh, how age relates to these, uh, Dr. Maida, you heard describe um, where age does and does not factor into that. Uh, with PPE, there's no age component. With EMS crisis standards, there's no age component. Palliative care, no age component. Behavioral health, no age component. And maternal and child health, no age component. So it really is only the hospital triage component that has even a small component of, of age that uh, enters into the crisis standards. So that's kind of where we are and where we're going. We do, we appreciate all the input from our uh, uh, the community involvement partners and input from others as well. It's been very helpful in terms of helping us refine our, our crisis standards to uh, to date. And Matt, that's all I've got. Excellent, thank you so much. So we'll move um, next to Gina Fabaro. Gina. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen as well. Uh, before I do, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Mehta and Dr. Cantrell for their leadership on behalf of the state of Colorado for working to develop the crisis of care standards for hospital triage, as well as um, contributing to all of those other components. Um, I think it's also fair to say that community engagement around these crisis standards of care across all of the components has been a team effort. Um, so I'd like to thank the Center on Aging and the Center for Bioethics um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, where I work, certainly could not um, achieve this level of conversation and dialogue and input uh, alone, particularly in the midst of a pandemic and response effort that we're involved in. So thank you to everyone. Um, the other thing I'll share as I'm sharing my screen here is that, let me just move this out of the way. Um, as Matt mentioned, I actually work in the Prevention Services Division. And um, though my role has focused on, on planning and uh, strategy for the last six years, I've uh, practiced community engagement through my entire career in maternal and child health, both in the nonprofit and the state sector. So um, coming to this work, I actually didn't have familiarity with crisis standards of care, uh, but I, I do have grounding in how to approach uh, the community engagement piece. So that's what I'm going to share a little bit about with you today. And this actually comes out of um, national best practice guidance on why public engagement is important when developing crisis standards of care. And that goes for hospital triage, gui triage guidelines, as well as all those other components that Dr. Kentrell presented. And it's important that these guidelines obviously reflect community values and priorities. So that's the primary reason to engage the community. But in addition, um, as we engage the community, we all are learning in this process about what it means to be in crisis, what is involved in making these difficult decisions, 
um, and educating the public and those we're working with uh, as we develop the guidelines. So when we kicked off our community engagement group, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, we, I presented this framework, and this is a framework I helped adopt years ago in maternal and child health. And it's really important because though um, in public health in general, we'd love to be on the right side of this continuum and have kind of shared leadership and partnership in this kind of work, um, the reality of the timeline and the fact that we're in a crisis situation, um, we really had to focus on the left side of this continuum where it's looking more around the, the outreach and consult. And what that means is kind of more like one-time input, um, doing a lot of, of outreach and communication, not as much kind of shared decision-making. And the reason for that, honestly, is just frankly time. Um, it takes a lot of time to bring a group together, have the right people at the table, build trust, have the dialogue, have the conversations. And this work has solely not been underway for very long. So we, we had some limitations in, in our approach. What we were able to accomplish is bringing um, community leaders along together with the subject matter advisory groups that were mentioned earlier. Um, we met weekly and sometimes by, you know, twice a week um, since mid-March. We were able to create a forum to share input from the community as well as discuss concerns. And really, the majority of our work in the beginning was around hospital triage standards, and now we're beginning to look at some of these other components. We designed a community, uh, a survey for community leaders, and we had about 11 responses from that and what some of the key questions and concerns were related to the hospital triage guidelines. We also developed a fact sheet and a frequently asked question document, and we did that again in partnership with the community engagement group. So in terms of who participated in that, we had representation across many different communities, people who experienced chronic conditions, disability community, communities of color, people from the aging community, et cetera. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the strengths and limitations of our work, but I think given the timeline, um, we were able to really connect with some key community leaders who were able to represent many, many people and organizations throughout Colorado. So this group is continuing to meet and um, we're continuing to explore um, the concerns around the work that we're doing. So some of the key com concerns that I thought would be of interest to share with this group, and particularly just to call out some of the concerns we heard prior to this call, um, is just overall fear of discrimination, and implicit bias, and I think Dr. Mehta did a great job of addressing how, how these um, hospital triage guidelines, you know, structurally and the way they're designed, address some of these key issues. And, and, and those have, the uh, way that was written has changed over time in partnership with community. And so, um, so I'm, I'm really proud of that accomplishment, I think, as all of us have participated in. It was a great team effort. And, um, and then finally, how important communication is to building public trust and informing people um, if we do need to activate these, um, how that will happen and what that will look like in practice. So some of the strengths of our work is we, we did have quite a diverse representation of communities. Um, we worked with a lot of leaders of statewide organizations who had access to many, many different communities across the state, and people were extremely engaged, um, you know, showing up for meetings, actively participating, lots of individual conversations outside of our ongoing uh, weekly meetings. Um, on the flip side, of course, as I mentioned, it was a very tight timeline, and so our engagement methods were limited. Um, we would have loved to have, have done more, um, have done more, and then also um, we kept kind of a smaller group because we had to move so quickly. And if you have a group of 20 or 30 community members and leaders, it's, it's sometimes very hard to give uh, meaningful feedback in a, in a concise and a, in a timely way. So, um, so we may have missed some representation. And in terms of the aging community, we did have um, the Colorado Chronic Care Collaborative who represents many organizations across the state, as well as um, representation from the Colorado Gerontological Society. Um, but as I said, it was a pretty small group, and so certainly there was probably an opportunity to engage more, and I'm sorry if we, we missed some of that, but we were grateful for the centers um, on aging and bioethics who've helped foster those conversations. So I will leave it at that, and I will look forward to questions. 
Thank you so much, Gina. And we do, um, we, we not only received a bunch of questions prior to the program, we've also been receiving questions as we go along here. Um, but I want to start with one that we got prior to, um, to starting today. Um, and I think it's for Gina, although I imagine there may be others who want to pipe in on this. There's been a lot of talk over the last month about the pandemic and and the idea of preventing hospitals from being overwhelmed. And we got a comment saying, no wonder people, especially aging people, are staying home um, and avoiding the hospital. And so we're starting now to see um, increased deaths from heart attacks and strokes from people at home who are presumably fearful um, of overburdening the healthcare system. And I'm just wondering, what do you think the messaging should be from the healthcare system today given where we are now, right? Where we're, we're not quite as fearful as we were a few weeks ago, but where we're also clearly not out of the woods. So I don't know, Gina, or maybe Steve, or any one of you might want to try and tackle this, but what, what do you think the messaging should be about uh, overburdening of the healthcare system uh, today and, and moving forward? Right, I can start with that. I think. Um, emergency medicine is very interested in that because we are very concerned that people are having myocardial infarctions at home and not seeking uh, care uh, in a timely fashion. And certainly with strokes, we have a very tight window when we can actually aggressively treat uh, strokes with, with good results. So our, we've always stressed that if you are having a true medical emergency, you need to call 911. If you're having difficulty breathing, you need to call 911. Um, if you're concerned that you might have been exposed to COVID, don't call 911. Then you want to call your primary care uh, provider. And um, But if it's a true emergency, we need to see you. Any other comments on that? I'll move to the next question. If, if others want to jump in, we'll, uh, we'll certainly entertain it. Um, we had a comment, uh, Anuj, to, that said, it seems to me because the triage guidelines include age as a factor, um, that they encourage age discrimination. So I, I'm just wondering um, if you could go back. Would it, as I understood what you were telling us, you're, you're saying that age is included in some components of the scoring systems but only because age is actually correlated with mortality separate from the other pieces of the scoring system. And I, I think maybe what this person was asking is something like, could you develop a very accurate um, predictive model that did not include age at all? Um, I think that's a great question, uh, Matt, and to the community member that asked that question. Um, so this actually, in addition to being an ICU doctor, I am a researcher as well, and I look at outcomes of patients that are on breathing machines, um, both in the short term and near term. And in some of my own research and other people's research confirms this, is that um, when you look at 40 different factors, and if you remember the slide about the modified Charleston comorbidity, so only 10 factors are in there, 10 or 12. If you look at 40 different things, including how sick you are today, um, age is still a very important predictor um, of one-year mortality. Even if you, um, you know, account and the statistical term we use is we adjust. Uh, but um, even if you account for cancer, diabetes, um, heart failure, heart attack, lung disease, age is still an important predictor. Um, in the same way that we consider cancer in that, right? You get points if you have a cancer um, because that's what the science tells us. Um, and only in that area is age considered. Um, and so, right, when I think of the word bias, I think of we make decisions without scientific knowledge. We make decisions just based on this one characteristic that may not correlate to anything else. And so, one, nobody's making a decision just because of age. It's incorporated into a score. And yes, you do get points in that score because of your age, but a lot of other things are considered. And so it is very conceivable that an 80 or 90 year old person with no other comorbidities who is not very sick, just maybe has, can't breathe from COVID, which is a lot of what we're seeing, 
would have a very, very low triage score. And low is a good thing. Um, you want a low triage score. Um, and so just because you're older does not necessarily mean you would not receive resources. And so we went, we were very careful about that idea. Um, and the people making these decisions actually probably won't even know the patient's age. They'll just get that triage score. And they may not be able to tell the difference between a 35-year-old with a triage score of three and an 80-year-old with a triage score of three. They won't have access to that information to the best cap to the best of that we can uh, provide that level of blinding. Yeah. Uh, we had a quick question here, uh, which is, has the Office of Civil Rights, uh, we, we know that there have been some lawsuits uh, or some complaints um, brought against some of the other states for the guidance that they have provided. Has the Office of Civil Rights looked at the Colorado document? And if so, is it, has it been approved in some way? Um, I, um, I, uh, I'm going to turn to Ms. Ferbrara and CDPHE. Um, I did answer that. I texted it. I, I wrote an uh, answer that we haven't heard of any criticisms, and we actually are in touch with the people that wrote the documents that were, um, uh, that, uh, where the, some of the lawsuits are, are originated, like in Pennsylvania, um, and they've been really fantastic collaborators with us, and we actually took those criticisms into account when we redrafted our document. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, I would say that one, uh, we've had attorney general representation from our state on the, um, on the community, or sorry, on the group that's developing these um, guidelines the entire time. So they also, they did a review. Uh, in addition, um, some of our disability community advocates um, shared this nationally with different partners and it's been reviewed um, very detailed review and so um, people were very supportive of the work that we've done. Um, so I think between those two, uh, the other thing I'll just mention is in the governor's executive order, which I went back and read recently around crisis standards of care, not activating them, but um, providing basically permission for them to be activated. He wrote specifically that no discrimination um, should take place in implementing these standards, um, which I thought was really great that the language was actually included um, in the executive order specifically. So, um, We have a couple questions related to advanced care planning. Um, and I think maybe I'll sort of bundle these together because some want to know uh, what should the medical profession, what should uh, people in the community, do with regard to advanced care planning and others want to know what is the state doing to try and um, facilitate better advanced care planning. I think, Dan, maybe we'll start with you since this gets right back to the point you were making earlier about um, how important it is in the current era for people to have had a chance to think through advanced care planning before they end up in a hospital and potentially in an ICU where they can't uh, you know, have visitors and that kind of thing. So anyone want to jump yeah. in on advanced planning? Yeah, you know, I can't comment necessarily on what the state's doing now in the setting of COVID. There were certainly some things the state was, was doing in terms of most forms and things that have been going on for a while. I don't know what's going on right now around it, but what you should do at home, I mean, advanced care planning is, it, it, I, I gave a talk at a church this last weekend on this. It's not as complicated as we make it out to be. It doesn't, all, it doesn't need a lawyer in Colorado. You don't have to, doesn't necessarily need a doctor. Um, there are free documents online. Um, uh, I'll look for a website, put it in the comments when I'm done talking. Hillary Lum in my division has put a whole website together um, for advanced care planning resources in Colorado. What I tell patients the most important thing is who's gonna speak for you if you can't speak for yourself. We can't predict all of these future decisions. So at a minimum, have a medical power of attorney. And don't just write somebody's name down that you haven't talked to. Make sure you talk to them so they know your perspective so that they can speak on your behalf. Um, and then there's all these other things about preferences for resuscitation and other things that are also important to write down. If you, have, if you say, I don't want to be resuscitated, I don't want a, a breathing machine, then making sure that's written down and documented if that's your preference is really important. But short of that, make sure somebody can talk, somebody is written down as your medical power of attorney who can speak on your behalf and then really have a conversation with that person. That gets you a long way there to helping the clinicians in the hospital make decisions for you on, on your, or with you and, and your family. 
Yeah, I'll find that resource and put it in the comments. Matt, I think it's Thanks, also Jeff. to note, it's important to note that in the hospital crisis to standards of care, we actually have a paragraph stressing how important it is to understand what the patient's wishes are in terms of their care. And hopefully that will encourage the care providers if that information is not forthcoming to try to solicit from the patient when they initially uh, appear in, uh, in a hospital. Hello, everyone. Um, the one thing I neglected to mention was I actually report to the chief medical officer, Dr. Eric France, and um, I, I returned once I saw this question to him because uh, advanced directive planning has come up in a lot of different conversations, and there's a lot of different efforts happening um, across the state. But I think what we need is some coordination to kind of relook at some of the concerns and make sure that we're coordinated in our promotion of resources and efforts. So. With that, we are looking at how we can resource some staffing um, from CDPHE to help provide some statewide coordination around that. Um, so I would just say stay tuned at this point and we'll continue to look into that. We've had a few questions, Gina, I wanna stay with you for a second because we've had a few questions um, from different angles about how uh, older people think about these issues. And it's just reminding me how heterogeneous um, the population of older people is. Um, and I'm wondering whether we know much about how the public thinks about triage decisions. Um, and in particular, I guess, do we know much about how older people tend to think about these issues? Or is it really quite variable and that some people think including age in triage decisions makes perfect sense? And of course, I would want the you know, ventilator to go to a younger person and others say that would be absolutely discriminatory. You shouldn't have any mention of age whatsoever. Um, how much variability is there? What do we know about that? <laughs> so Matt, I would turn this question back to you because <laughs> you are the researcher in this area and I am relatively new. Um, my understanding, well, so I'm just going to leave it there because I do not claim to be an expert in what the public thinks. I mean, honestly, we had six weeks to kind of generate thinking around this. And so I know you actually study this. So can you speak to this by any chance? <laughs> I may be able to. Dan, do you want to say anything first, though? Because I know you've thought about this a little also. Just we, you build decision models and tools to help people make complex, difficult decisions. Um, this may be one of the most complex, difficult decisions ever. Um, but uh, do, do you, what's your sense of the variability within a, a category of, of people in terms of the typical variability in terms of, of these kind of decisions? Oh, it's hugely variable. I know in some surveys um, that a pretty consistent number, fairly consistent, about 5 or 10% of people in surveys when you ask about preferences for aggressiveness want everything regardless. They're going to go down swinging in the ICU and nothing's going to stop them. Um, but that's only about 5 or 10% of people. The other 90, 90 to 95% of people have a varying degree of preferences from, I don't want you to do anything to me, to maybe I'll have a little bit, but then if I get sick, a little less. It's actually the minority that really want the big ICU experience at the end of life. Hmm. Um, I, am, I, I did see another question earlier as well about um, this question of messaging and the problems that people have in determining whether it's time to go to the emergency room or not. And I know Steve had to step off the call, but I'm wondering between Anuj and Dan, um, do you guys wanna say anything about the difficulty people have in knowing whether to go to an emergency room? Um, and is there anything that we can do or should be doing as a profession to help people make that kind of a decision, given that there is this tension right now between, you know, not wanting to go and overburden the healthcare system, not wanting to go and maybe catch COVID while you're at the hospital, mm -hmm. um, but also not wanting to stay home when you really ought to go to the hospital. Are there tools out there that, that might help? I don't know if there are tools. Um, I think uh, this is a situation where, you know, what I tell people, if you're scared and things are different and you don't feel right, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a wishy-washy statement a little bit, but call your doctor or go to the emergency room. Both are good options. If you're not sure 
go to the emergency room. The healthcare system has the capacity um, uh, uh, to, to handle. Um, now we do. We have the health, with, um, most ERs are actually not overtaxed right now. Um, but this is where kind of you have to apply good common sense. If you're just a little bit worse than you typically are, if you have some lung disease, you're a little bit more short of breath, um, say you have COPD, you're coughing a little bit more, you may have a low grade fever. This is a situation where you can call your doctor. But if you can't get in touch with your doctor or you are so short of breath that it's a major change for you, um, then that's where, you know, calling 911 or just, you know, going straight to the emergency room is appropriate. I think that, you know, the concern about catching COVID, luckily in Colorado, as much as we have a crisis standard of care for PPE, there is adequate PPE. So not so the health care, you're protected from the healthcare workers because they're wearing masks. The surgical masks are there to prevent the, um, is to protect the, not the person wearing the mask, but to protect everyone else around them. And so, you know, I, I think that what I'm really concerned as an ICU doctor, and I've seen this a couple times, is when people show up too late. Um, and so, so obvious things like a stroke, right? If you, your face is drooping, you can't talk, you can't move one of your arms, um, or you're having really bad chest pain, and that's new for you and very different, you know, go to the emergency room because we can help. Okay. Yeah, just to jump on that, Matt, I, I honestly think one of the hardest things clinically has been trying to help patients decide, is this something I need to do now or can I put this off? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the risk-benefit ratio has changed a little bit. Things are a little riskier, you know, the last month. So mm -hmm. things that where I would have said, why don't you come get that test this week? I'm saying, well, let's see how you do and maybe wait till June. But I guess I would just also, to add to Anuj, give us a call. If you're wondering, have a low threshold for calling us, we, um, you know, in the outpatient setting, a lot of docs have been a little less busy um, just because they're not seeing patients in clinic. Um, so I'd have a low threshold for trying to at least talk to somebody because I think that's a hard thing for, for people to do. And I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got a really interesting question about how the um, scoring system works, both the, and I think this applies across the uh, SOFA score, but also the Charleston score. Someone wanted to know, do these scores look at mitigating positive factors? They seem like they're, they, they, they only give you decrements. There's nothing you can do to get a benefit, right? So if you're super healthy in some regard, that never comes into play. The scoring systems only give you dings on your on your score and Anuj I'm wondering whether you've thought through you know the pros and cons of trying to create a scoring system that might give you both positives and negatives instead of you know sort of starting with perfect health and then taking uh, steps down from that. Um, I love the idea and I think that's an area that research can move towards I mean this idea of like if you regardless of your age if you're able to run four or five miles a day well, that doesn't mean you're, you're the healthiest person alive. You know, that might be a positive predictive sign that you're more likely to survive a critical illness. We just don't know. Um, the way our health system is designed is um, to look at diseases. Um, and so when we, a lot of these scoring systems were uh, developed out of big databases um, and what they had were things wrong with patients and it's really hard to capture the positive things. Um, what I will say is that there's also things that, you know, we can't capture really easily in any of these scoring systems, like somebody who smokes or has other, you know, um, uh, dangerous habits that could affect their mortality. So none of these systems are perfect. And we acknowledge that. I think that's really important to start off with. There's no perfect scoring system. There's no perfect prediction model. Um, it's uh, just trying to do the best that we can do. Um, but I think that this idea of incorporating positive factors um, is maybe a way we should move in terms of how we think about data collection um, and looking at patients and could we design a system like that? But it's just not something that's easily captured yeah. at this time. And Anuj, we're just gonna do one more question because we are right almost at time, but a um, couple different questions related to the sort of operationalization of this and how do you actually collect information on all these um, things? in real time in what may be a catastrophic circumstance where it's really, you know, very pressured in terms of time. Um, what are your thoughts about completing this modified Charleston score in the midst of a crisis? Yeah, um, the, the reason we worked so fast 
um, to develop these and then had to come out with version two on Sunday was specifically to give advice to hospitals to, um, to um, set systems in place to do this very quickly. Um, so a lot of systems are automating this in the electronic health record. Um, so you get admitted and, and you, they just have to type in your medical history and all of a sudden you get a triage score. There's some online calculators that we've developed to help that process. Um, so you need to know just a little bit of knowledge to be able to calculate this score. Um, you know, one thing, the reality of this, uh, this pandemic is that it's actually not two people that are being weighed at the exact same time. It's not two patients and you only have one ventilator um, and you have to decide who gets it. That's how we all think about the situation, but that's actually not how it's playing out. What it is is that you have five or six people presenting over the course of the day um, who need a ventilator and you only have three or four. And so how do you decide in real time sequentially who gets it? And, um, and so you have a little bit more time um, and it involves calculating a, a score cutoff. So most of the time people are weighed actually against a cutoff score, not necessarily against another patient. Um, and that's a little bit more complicated concept and I'm happy to um, respond to any follow-up questions about that um, in email or text. Yes, that will that will be an entire hour of our uh, <laughs> of our next webinar, yeah. perhaps, because that is a complicated set of issues around the oper operationalizing this. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today. Um, this was a wonderful conversation, really important. Um, even though, as we all sort of started out acknowledging, uh, we are hopeful that this whole conversation is hypothetical. Um, and that we never actually need to implement um, these. But they say something really important about our values as a society. They say something really important about um, the moral principles that we think of when we make really critical decisions. So thank you all for being a part of this conversation. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on our next webinar.